Okay, good work. Let's uh, dedicate our story tonight to um, uh, Mrs. Rivka Yaron's father's yard site, which was today. Today, today's yard site or this week? Today's yard site. I can't hear you. Monday evening. Monday evening. And the yard site of Shmuel Zavol Ben Chaim. The yard site is tonight. And the Bolchem Tei Maruchim. Tonight's the birthday of Ryan Maccabi. It's was for him for year of Bracha Vatslacha Gashmis Rufnis. Um, it's customary on Motzei Shabbos, Saturday night, to talk about the Baal Shem Tev. One of the most fundamental teachings of the Baal Shem Tev is about divine providence. And I'll share a few stories about divine providence tonight. Before I do, I want to talk a little bit about the origin of the Baal Shem Tev, the teachings of the Baal Shem Tev, and how they came to us. The Baal Shem Tev had a teacher whose name was Achia Hashilani. In another story a few months ago, I shared how he met Achia Hashilani, but just for today, I want to mention that Achia Hashilani was someone who witnessed the splitting of the Red Sea. He was one of the Jews who left Egypt, and he lived for a very long time, and he is considered to be the seventh of those who passed the torch on from Moshe Rabbeinu from Moses. Moshe Rabbeinu taught the Torah to Joshua, and Joshua taught the Torah to uh, Pinchas, and Pinchas taught it to Eli, and Eli taught it to Shmuel, and Shmuel taught it to David, and David taught the Torah to Achiashili. So the teachings of Al Shem Tev are, you know, they're, as my kids say, they're OG. They're, they're pure from the original source, seventh generation uh, from, from the Baal, from Moshe Rabbeinu, and the Baal Shandav is the eighth in that, in that line. Baal Shandav taught that divine providence is in every detail in creation, even a leaf blowing in the wind. And the Baal Shandav says specifically, sometimes there's a leaf that, was, that fell off a tree last year, and it's wandering around someone's backyard, and, and God has a purpose for it. And Hashem causes a storm to happen in the middle of the summertime, middle of a hot summer day, there's all of a sudden a storm, or that the leaf should be transferred from where it is to a, another location. So in that context, um, the previous Sheba shared a personal story about himself and how he learned about divine providence in a different way. And, and he said like this, he said that divine providence is in the most minute, in the minutia, things which we consider to be absolutely insignificant. Yes, yet divine providence is, a, is connected to things that we think are of no importance. Hashem, Hashem, so to speak, personally takes interest in the slightest detail of creation. And, and it's for Hashem's intent. And then the, pre, and the Baal Shem Tov said, if, if, if Hashem takes such care about the leaves and the, the leaves, and the blades of grass, how much more so can we, the divine providence that God gives his people, Am Karevei, the people that are called close to him, can you imagine how much care God has for each of us and guiding us where we need to be in life? It was in 1896, Tavre Shunvav, in a city called Belivka, Belivka is a city near the city of Lubavitch, where the previous Sheba grew up. And he said that the grain was almost ripe, the crops were almost ripe. And there was a gentle breeze, and he saw the, the um, grain and the grass nodding in the, in, the, in the breeze. He went for a walk with his father, the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Rebbe of Chabad. And the Rebbe Rashab made the following comment. He said to his son, look at, look at every blade of grass, look at its movements. Every blade of grass and every ear of corn, uh, every, uh, every movement was included in God's original thought when he made the world. When God, Kabbalah teaches that when God made the world, there was one thought that God had for all of creation, 
And that thought contained within it all of the future of history, the end of all, the end of all time. So divine providence, said the Rebbe Rashab, fulfills God's intent of all of creation and all, and every single movement, every blade of grass, it's all was all included in God's thought and God gazes, so to speak, at all of creation and, and, and guides where all of creation needs to be. That was the theme that the, David, that was a theme the Rebbe Rashab was talking about, divine providence and every movement, every blade of grass, and he was showing us something like the actual movements of the wind, you know, he, he's pointing to him, saying this is, this is all included in God's original thought for, for creation, every, all this is all part of divine providence. And then, as the previous Rebbe is talking to his father, walking with his father, he took a leaf off a tree, and he started to play with it and move it and rip pieces off of it, and his father noticed this, and his father reprimanded him very sharply. He said that Rizal writes that every leaf, not only does it have godly energy in it, but that Rizal says further that in every leaf, there is a spark of, of a soul that has to go come to this world to be rectified. In every single leaf, there is a spark of a soul that has to be rectified. And therefore, said the Rebbe Hashab, think about it. He said, the Torah says that, a, the Talmud says that a person is always considered responsible for his deeds. Whether he's awake or whether he's asleep, you're always considered to be responsible for what you do. That's what the uh, Talmud says. So the Rebbe Hashab commented, he said, the difference between a person uh, being, being awake or being asleep their mind, a person's mind, the person's heart, the person's emotions, the person's intellect is different when he's awake and, and when he's asleep is very different. That's why when you have a dream, you have all these paradoxes which seem that they're true in your dreams. Why is that possible? Because you're, so while you're asleep, your, your thought process is a little convoluted. But where is it apparent? Where can you notice the difference between a person who's awake or asleep? The difference is more noticeable in their eyes in their power of vision. So he said that being awake means that you have a clear vision, you see Hashem's presence, and being asleep means that you don't notice Hashem's presence. That's the spiritual meaning of being awake or being asleep. And here the Rebbe Hashem said, we're talking about divine providence. And I forgot to mention, it was precisely because the previous Rebbe was so overwhelmed by what his father was saying that he absentmindedly started to tear at the leaf. It was because he was so taken by his father's words. The Rebbe Hashab said to him, but nevertheless, a person is always responsible for their actions, whether they're awake or whether they're asleep. And here, the Rebbe Hashab said, look at what you're doing. You just heard how everything in the world is, is guided by divine providence, and even leaf blown in the wind. And what are you doing as you're hearing this? You are ripping apart this, this leaf. You're playing with it, you're tearing it apart. The Rebbe Hashab said, every single thing in the world has a purpose. Why do you think that its purpose is different than your purpose? It is true that Rebbe Hashab said, you cannot compare the purpose of vegetation to the purpose of a human. But yet, you have to remember that everything has a mission. And you can't, in other words, you can't interfere with, with the mission of each creature. I know my great-great-grandfather, my great Rabbi Ramayor Drizin, Oh, Shalom. He would, when he would walk on grass, he would always try to tread lightly because of this teaching of divine providence on the godly energy of creation. And it, it, it gave him a, this feeling of, of being very, very gentle of all of God's creatures. And he, he would tread lightly whenever he walked, especially. Uh, even the soles of his shoes weren't, weren't like the regular soles of a regular person's shoes because he would try to try to tread lightly. He wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't like, you know, stop. So uh, the um, Rebbe Hashab continued talking to his son about the idea how the Gemara says that even a mosquito was created before a human being, how there's divine providence and everything. And for the next couple of days, they would, as they walked together in Belivka, 
The Abra Hashab continuously spoke to his son again and again, explained more and more about the role of each creature and the purpose of each creature. And on that note, I just want to share something that happened today. We had with us uh, the emissary of the Rebbe to Petach Tikva, Rabbi Deitch Petach Tikva. And by divine providence, he shared with us an amazing story. Amazing in its message, I think. He was, it was 1973. And that time, it wasn't so common for people to bring their children to spend time uh, at the Rebbe's court for the Tishrei holiday. Um, wasn't so common at that time. He was. Um, he went there that year. He said there was three other kids that went. Um, and the Rebbe showed him a lot of closeness. Every time they went into the shul, that would make with his hand to encourage a singing specifically at him. He was you know, one of the only kids that was there visiting from Israel, three, one of three kids. So he said that it was night of Simchas Torah, and he didn't understand new Yiddish, but the Rebbe's Yiddish was different than his, to his Yiddish. He, he is, his father is Rabbi Chaim Shalom Daich, the head of the uh, Chabad Kolel in Yerushalayim, the Tzemach Sadek Kolel. And uh, he's, where, he's with his father, and they're watching as the Rebbe enters the shul to go to dance with the Torah, Simchas Torah. The Rebbe stops in front of them, Rebbe looks at him, the cute little boy with, you know, the Yerushalmi Peyas. Rebbe says to him, why are you dancing so little? In Yiddish. So he didn't understand the Rebbe's Yiddish because he used to Yerushalmi Yiddish. The Rebbe's Yiddish is more Russian. So the, both the accent and the wording was a little different than what he was used to. So the Rebbe repeated again. So he responds, ah, I don't get it. So Rebbe said a third time, Bavos why are you dancing so little? He says, okay, I understand. And um, uh, he actually said that um, he was a little bit frightened of the Rebbe afterwards because like he got in trouble. Like that was sort of like screaming at him. Why, why aren't you dancing so much? But then uh, it was rectified when they had an audience with the Rebbe before they left. And if I remember correctly, he said, the Rebbe gave him a siddur. Rebbe said, I'm giving you a siddur with a tehillim. And Hashem should accept all your good prayers. You give a present of a sitter and a tilt. Anyway, so, so on that note, um, I want to share a more contemporary story of divine providence. Actually, I want to start, share two stories. One story, which I'm not sure the details of the story. I didn't hear it firsthand. And I read it in a, a, a Kbar Chabad magazine, and the person who shared the story didn't know the source. But the message of the story is very powerful. And there's another story which I have actual details of the story about, uh, from the first person who had this said about them themselves. And here we go. First story goes like this: there was a there were these parents of a, a young boy who was in a doesn't say which Hasidus he was part of, some kind of Hasidus Satan or Bells Baba. He was part of one of these Hasidic groups, and he really couldn't open up a book of the Talmud. And he was in high school, he was in Masifta. And the head of his yeshiva called over his father before, at the end of the year, he says, listen, in this yeshiva, the main subject is Talmud. Your son's not getting into anything in Talmud. I don't see a purpose of him staying here and you know, making trouble because he can't understand, he's not really part of it. I want, to, I want to feel successful in life. So why should he be here in the middle of this, of this school and not being able to learn Gemara let him go do something else. Let him get a job. And he'll feel some fulfillment in life. He's going to be here trying to learn Gemara when he can't really do it. So the father, he wasn't so happy about it, but he realized the wisdom of this teacher's words. So the father uh, got him a job. Father didn't make so much, didn't have such a great living. So he actually was appreciative of the fact he didn't have to pay any more for tuition for a son. And he got him a job as a Gabai's helper. He was a Gabai of their synagogue. And the Gabai needed an assistant or wouldn't, wouldn't mind having an assistant. And uh, so he became the Gabai's helper. So he needed someone to put the tables together. They needed someone to go purchase things for the synagogue. They needed to do whatever it was. This boy, let's call him Yankel. Yankel went and he was the helper of the synagogue. And after a couple of weeks, Yankel is bored out of his mind. His job is just boring. It's so easy. It's like simple. Like buy, sell, get, what? 
light a candle. There's no, there's no, no challenge in the job. He didn't like it. He's going to tell his dad, 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 I like this job. It's boring. And his father said, listen, you have a roof. His father didn't understand him. His father was like, listen, you have a roof over your head. You have food to eat. Don't complain. So the boy did complain, didn't like it until he managed to put some money together and buy himself an MP3 player. Bought an MP3 player and he started to listen to music and a whole world opened up for him. He was listening to music and it really filled him. It filled his heart and his mind. He was listening to music all day and he loved it. He had these ear earphones and he was listening to music. He loved it. And um, what happened was their Rebbe, their, their leader was going to visit their synagogue. And to prepare for his visit, they had to construct these, these bleachers, these, these bleachers so that all the, all the Hasidim could stand and see their, their, their Rebbe as he walks in and, and, and uh, talks to his Hasidim. So he was already, at the time, he was there for several, I, I forgot to mention, he had concluded his, um, his, 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 his high school and uh, he was for several years already working as a gabba. He was now about 21 years old. And uh, he, he was given the task of constructing the bleachers for the Rebbe. So he, he was very happy to do this. New kind of thing and a little more challenging. And he constructed the, the bleachers. But for whatever reason, he, 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 he missing screws, whatever it was, the bleachers he constructed came crashing down. They broke, and there were there were Baruch Hashem, No one got hurt in the synagogue because no one was there yet for that. But arrived, and uh, no one, no one, you know, chastised them. It's not your fault, and they they rebuilt it. But it was a tragedy for him. The tragedy for him was that his MP3 player broke. An MP3 player where for him was like life. This was your music, and your and he loved it, and. He was, you know, was moving all day with this, with the, with the Hasidic music he was listening to. He loved it. Now he has an MP3 player. So he went to his dad and, and he home that day, and he tells his dad how upset he is. He doesn't have an MP3 player, and his dad, again, it was doesn't do so well financially, and he had his, you know, his pack of trouble from the day. He, he doesn't doesn't really listen to his son. He's like, whatever, you know, it, it comes and goes, and he didn't couldn't for him at that time financially. Buying a new MP3 player was the same price as a few nights of dinner. And of course, you know, the few nights of dinner goes before an, an ex extravagant need of an MP3 player. He tells his son, listen, I can't get an MP3 player. Just, you know, be happy with what you have. And that's all. The boy is not happy at all. And the next day in the synagogue on the bulletin board, he sees a sign. The sign says, M free MP3 player. Call this number. So he calls a number. He says, is it true you guys giving out MP3 players? He says, yeah. They say, yeah. There is a MP3 player with eight gig. And you have to put in one gig of classes of Daf Yemi. And if you promise to listen for an hour on Daf Yemi, so then you are able to... Um, to uh, get this MP3 player, and you only, only give one gig for the Daf Yemi, and they could put whatever you want, another seven gig. So he really wanted to get MP3 players, so he agrees. And sure enough, two days later, a package comes in the mail, MP3 player with a gig of classes and of Daf Yemi. And, and it was a totally altruistic thing. Whoever was donating for this told him on the phone, We just want people to learn Daf Yemi, no catch. That's what it is. So he listens to that, and, but, I'm sorry, he told the guy on the phone, like, I don't know how to Guy's like, you don't have to know how to You open the Gemara, listen to the class, and that's all you have to do. That's your commitment, all right? So he gets the MP3 player in the mail. He opens up the Gemara. He listens to class. It's above Metzia. He has no idea what the guy is saying, what the class is about. He listens the whole hour. The next day he's thinking, you know, the commitment he made wasn't to listen to a different class every day. It was to listen to Gemara every day. So he listened to the same class the next day and the same class the day after. And for 20 days in a row, he's listening to the same class again and again and again until he started to understand it. And then he went to the next page and the next page. In about a year, he finished the entire track, the above Mitzvah. He made a little party. 
by now, our uh, hero is 25 years old. He's learning Gemara, and he's in, he's in the, he's, he's what's called an Elter Abacher. In his circle, he's already an old young man, and he's not into, uh, he's not yet, not, not yet married. One day, he sees two 50-year-old men, they've been in their 50s, learning a Gemara, and one of them asks the other a question. And they're trying to figure out the question. He says, this is easy. He, says, he interrupts the conversation. He says, I'll tell you the answer. And the answer is that Abayi says this, and Rav says that, and Abayi says that, and that's the answer. Okay. A few days later, here's again their discussion. They're, they're figuring, trying to figure, he, he, he said, I'll, I'll tell you, it's, 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 it's not so hard. The Rashi said this, but Taisa said that, and wow. No, thank you. That's, that's, that really helps a lot. The Gabai, his boss, comes over to him a few weeks later. Months later, I'm not sure exactly when. He comes over to him and he says to him, I have an idea for you for a shidduch. Now, the, the, this guy, he um, is a very prominent family, and they really want to have someone who is a Torah scholar to join their family. And there are a lot of people that want to meet the uh, the uh, this this guy's this family's um, bride to be this this the, the, this potential candidate for a shidduch. I have no idea why this guy must be. I don't know what he's thinking. He they want you to meet their daughter. I have no idea why because you know obviously you're not a Torah scholar, but that's what they want. Can't figure it out. I'm gonna go speak to your dad. Let's see if he's in, if, if your family's interested. Boy, you know, turns red, of course, you know, like what, what, what a backhanded um, compliment or whatever it is. And he goes to meet this girl and they get married. Who was this girl? This girl was the daughter of one of those 50 year old men who was studying the murder. And they re- this guy realized that this boy who was, who was working in the, in the shul, he is an eminent Torah scholar. He may not look like an eminent Torah scholar, but he really knew his stuff. And so the point of the, the story is not only about divine providence, but also how you know Hashem guides every person towards where to, to accomplishing things. And sometimes it looks like the opposite. Hashem is you know, knocking you down is actually lifting you up. And we're you know very small minded. We, we don't see the big picture. So that's um, I'll tell you one more story. This story is about Rabbi uh, Buskila. There was a rabbi in Morocco, in Dov Buskila, and he has a son today who's a rabbi in the largest congregation of Moroccan, uh, for, for Moroccan Jews in the Moroccan community in Brooklyn and Flatbush. His name is God Buskila. So Rabbi Dov Buskila was once approached by the rabbi's emissary to Morocco, Rabbi Raskin, and he said that he wants to translate the Tanya into Arabic. The Tanya has been translated in many other languages. And the Rebbe wants to translate the Tanya in Arabic as well. And he feels that the only person to do this is Abdav Buskila. So Abdav's like, I'm busy, I can't do it. But the Raskin, if anyone who knew him, he was a very, very sincere and uh, a person and you couldn't really say no to him. So they started studying Tanya almost every day. And it took, because of Rabbi Baskil's other commitments, it took 10 years for the project to be completed. And after 10 years, it was successful that Tanya was translated into Arabic. The Rebbe gave a special talk about this accomplishment. The Rebbe spoke about the power of translating the Tanya into other languages, and especially into Arabic. I'm giving a Jew who has the ability, who does not have the ability to study Tanya in its original, and now able to study Tanya because the Tanya is now in Arabic, and how beneficial this is for, for the Jew, this Jew, and how there's a power in transforming the, um, the, the languages or nations of the world as some kind of spiritual accomplishment by just using, um, by, by the Tanya being another language as a spiritual impact on the nation that speaks that language and speaks Arabic. So that's a printed talk of the Rebbe in, uh, and Rabbi uh, Buskila had, was also invited 
to come to the Rebbe from Morocco with Rabbi Raskin uh, after he completed this, this 10 year um, task of translating the Tanya into Arabic. His son, of God, asked his father many times to share with him what the Rebbe told him. He didn't, want, he didn't really want to share because it was personal and who knows what many other reasons, I don't know. But his father only told him one thing that, that the Rebbe said that to break the clipper, to break the unholy force of Yishmoel, the Tanya need to be translated into Arabic in order to break the unholy, unclean clipper of, of, of Ishmael. Interestingly, also, uh, Reb God Vaskila, he came to United States in 1980. He came to learn in yeshiva, but someone introduced him to someone, he wanted to get married, and uh, he told his father, and they already gone out. They were, uh, his father said, like, no, you went to learn. You, you were supposed to, you're supposed to come back to Morocco. You're not supposed to stay in America now. We don't, what are you doing there? What are you talking about? And he doesn't know what to do. And finally, his father says, there's one, only one way I'm going to agree to this, this match. And that is, if the Lubavitch Rebbe is a blessing to the Shidduch, then I'll agree. Okay. Oh, he has no choice. He, 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 he cannot get married without his father's consent. So he and his bride to be come to the Rebbe's office. I think their scheduled um, time to meet was at eight o'clock. They came at six o'clock to be sure to be on time. And the audience wasn't until 10 30. They're for four hours waiting to speak to the Rebbe. And the Rebbe, the Rebbe says to his wife, Do you know who your. Uh, your 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 uh, the Hassan's parents are. She says, "No, I don't know too much about them." I said, "You should know that your husband's father has, or your fiance, or whatever title they're used because they weren't engaged yet. He has a tremendous merit in bringing the coming of a shift, bringing the redemption, because uh, he translated the Tanya into Arabic. You should just know kind of tremendous merit that this family has." Never give a blessing to the Shidduch and he got married. This Rabbi Gadbaskila, he, um, last story, Rabbi Gadbaskila, he um, wanted in 1980, he noticed in Flatbush, there's a lot of Jews from Morocco, but they didn't have a synagogue. So he decided he's going to try out making um, a high holiday service for Moroccan Jews, to do it in the Moroccan tradition, and see if anybody responds. He made a little advertisement, not so, and a huge response. There's 300 people that joined their meeting. At the end of Yom Kippur, he says, listen, guys, we have this place in Yom Kippur, but we really need a place. You know, we know, need to own a place that should be for Moroccan Jews. Who wants to donate to buy a building for, for, a, for a show? Pledges and pledges and pledges. Everyone's excited about it. They had pledges of $200,000. And uh, and so they now have to go find a place. Where is that? Where are they going to find a place for a shul? So it was he couldn't find a place for a shul. He couldn't. He, he's he's looking all over. He has to, and after about half a year, half a year, six months later, a hundred thousand of the pledges came in already. They already you know they have have a nice amount of money, but he cannot find anything suitable. So his father-in-law, Rabbi Tzemach, Yitzchak Kalevi Kadi says to him, listen, let's go to the Rebbe for a blessing. He, he knew what it meant to visit the Rebbe in 1980. The Rebbe gives you a dollar and Mikala Kavol, with all due respect, you don't have more than a second with the Rebbe. So his father was like, he, he didn't know what the value really was of going to the Rebbe because you can't, you don't have that much time to talk to the Rebbe. But his father says, no, we, the Rebbe is the Rebbe. You just go to the Rebbe and we have to ask for a brah. So his father went to the Rebbe and asked for a brah what he needed. And then he went to the Rebbe, and he, and he, and he sorry, then he introduced his son-in-law. He said, my son-in-law also needs to build, trying to find a place for the Jews in Morocco to have a shul, to build something for them. And we gave him a dollar, and they said, this is for the, for building. Okay. They leave the Rebbe's 770. And he go, they go to play in a, they go to pray Mincha in a shul, in a flatbush called Bnei Yosef. After Mincha, they notice in a one of the houses next to the shul exactly 
next to the car that they that his father in law parked, next to the where his father in law parked, there was an advertisement the size of a not bigger than a postcard that said this this building is for sale with a number. So his father in law knocks on the door adjacent to this house, which is for sale, and on this little postcard that's for sale. He knocks on the door next, and the guy he asks the guy, guy in the house next door, "Do you know the owner of this home?" He says, "Yeah, it's a doctor, doctor, doctor Beam, doctor Beam." Okay, where does he live? He tells him where he lives. So he tells the son law "We're going there right now." So why are you going now? It's Sunday night. Uh, that Sunday night, they went to Doctor Beam's house. Uh, doctor Beam says, "I can't talk to you guys. I don't have my lawyer with me. I'm supposed to speak to you." He says, "Listen, just tell me." He didn't want to speak to them. But his father was very persistent. He says, how much do you want? He says, I want 275. 275, agreed. I'll give you the first $1,000 right now, and I want you to sign you agree to sell it for that amount. Surprisingly, even though the guy was like, so like, I need my lawyer, I need my lawyer, but just, he, he said, listen, my son law needs this for a shul, for a synagogue. Please, actually, I forgot to mention, he actually lowered the price. It wasn't 275. He lowered it because it was for the shul, and he gave it them for 250, for 250. And he and he gave him a thousand dollars in the spot, and he's and they they sold it at that. And till today, 1617, 1617 Ocean Parkway is the home of the largest shoal from Rock and Jews in Flatbush. Till today, they built a huge, huge, beautiful shoal there and developed beautifully. And Rabbi Gabaskula says it's. It's only because of the Rebbe's bracha, and uh, till today, that's why that's that they're still there with with the Rebbe's blessing. And um, as we discussed in today by the Ferengen, Mashiach will come. All shuls will be transported to Shulaim and be adjacent to the base of Migdash. In fact, Rabbi, um, one last thing to tell you guys, let you guys go. That is two minutes. Doctor Pelta, unbelievable. Doctor Pelta shared at the Ferengen today that there were 900 shuls in um, Poland before the war. And he said these shuls were 400 years old. And there's a book of, which has a picture of all these shuls. And the cover of the book is his father's shul. He comes from Poland. And he said, in his, he said that his father told him that his, the shamash of the shul, the gabai, the shul, once took his father to the, with a bunch of all the children in the shul, and to the roof of the shul. These shuls are from the time of Chomonitsky. Chomonitsky ravaged all of Poland and Europe, and killed hundreds of thousands of Jews in 1648. So these shuls, these 900 shuls, were, were ravaged by the Germans, but they were 400 years old. The book, which has his father's shul, I've got the name of the book, it, it, I think it's called Wooden Shuls, only that. There's 34, there aren't 900 shuls in the book, but there are not 34 shuls in the book. And he said that his father's shul, his father, I'm sorry, was once taken with the, the gabe, shows the, the children the shul, and they go up to the, to the roof of the shul. And the shul, all these 900 shuls were made out of wood. And not only they made of wood, there was no metal in all the shul. The entire shul was not, all, even the, the, there's no nails, it was wooden pegs. And the reason they made the shuls that way was in order that the shuls should be able to be transported to Yerushalayim with Mashiach. Why they decide to do this exactly after Chmonitsky, I'm not sure. But the truth is, we don't need to have any, any uh, wagons to br- bring our shuls and to bo- boats to bring to Yerushalayim, because we know that it says in the Gemara that if we merit, we go to Yerushalayim with Ananish Maya, with clouds from heaven, and therefore there's no need for. For wooden shoals, we could have the clouds transport them. But just to show you the, the way the Jews believed in Mashiach, all these shoals, every single one of these 900 shoals was built of wood with no metal whatsoever, just because the shul needs to be transported to Shalim very immediately with the coming of Mashiach. So, Shem Shalap Asal, we should be married in the Simcha, we should dance this Venik, the dance Asach, until we get into the Simcha of the Gula, Mashiach Sakenu. Amen. Any questions Amen. or comments? Yeah, so Rabbi Levin, I just wanted to share that uh, I think it was last week on Thursday. <coughs> I don't know if it was in Hayom Yom or it was uh, this kid's chitas thing that I listened to, but 
basically a Jew is responsible for his own thoughts. Uh, to tie to the earlier story that you gave, and then the story that you gave about the the shidduch and the guy being, I guess, uh, mistaken for Tom Chacham. So before I got married, I don't know. There's not like a really good reason. I'm a really hard person to get up in the morning, but I like committed to for the entire year. Really, it was like a year before I got married. Um, it was like uh, committed to like doing Dafyomi at Young Israel, Rabbi Yitzchok. So it was like super early. <laughs> and uh, um, so, yeah, so I ended up getting my wife with that. But then when you're married to Bas Cohen, they say that you have to be married to Tom Chacham. So uh, I made it a point to learn one Masechet, just like oh. the guy in the, in, in the story. And uh, so that's, uh, I don't know, that's the kind of the connection. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful, beautiful. Awesome. Please, please share the story with, with, our, with our friend that we met last week. All right. A good of David. Good of, David, tonight's Ryan Maccabi's birthday. Send him, send him, send, send him a happy birthday. I will. All right. Happy good birthday. Love you. Good love to you there. Good love.